Today we begin a series talking about the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's different ways to try to understand this, that we use some human or some earthly things to try to make sense of how there could be three separate, distinct parts of God, but yet all one together. That's very complicated for our minds to grasp. Some people illustrate it as a shamrock. It's kind of like three leaves on one plant. Um, you know, they're, they're all together, but yet they're, they're different as well. Some people use the egg. The egg has a shell and a yolk and the white of the egg, and just how each part forms together and becomes one thing. Um, that's kind of the way God is. Um, the illustration breaks down a little bit because whenever you're going to use the egg and get rid of the shell, and we don't want to get rid of part of God. So it's not a perfect illustration, but it kind of helps us. Um, sometimes the, the Trinity has been explained as water. Water can take three different forms depending on the temperature. It can either be a liquid, it can be a solid when it turns to ice, or it can be a gas. It turns to steam when it's too hot. Um, but of course, God is not changing. God doesn't go from one part to the other. So it kind of breaks down a little bit, but we kind of understand that just as water can take on three forms, God takes on three forms as well, but he is always those three forms. Um, some have tried to illustrate the, the Trinity as a pair of pants. We have two holes where the legs go out and one hole where the waist goes through, and but yet it's one pair of pants. We even put pants in plural. You don't have pant, they're pants, because they are there's more than one in one. So it's kind of complicated in a way. God is kind of like a pair of pants as well. The Trinity reveals God's essence, who he is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each one, and this picture's on the front of your bullets in there, God is Father, Son, and Spirit, but the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, the Father is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, the Holy Spirit is not the Son, the Son is not the Son. They're distinct beings, but yet they are all in one. And so, um, as it's been said by the early church theologian Tertullian, he said that the doctrine of the Trinity has to be divinely revealed. God just has to reveal it to us, because if we try to humanly construct it, we can't do it. Our mind cannot grasp it. There are not the words, there are not the understanding in our brain to really grasp it how they can all be three different, but yet three in one. Someone said, if you try to explain it, you'll lose your mind, which you kind of do trying to figure it out. But if you deny it, you'll lose your soul. This is a basic Christian teaching that God has revealed who he is. If we're going to worship God and serve God and understand how God gets the glory, we have to at least to whatever level of faith that we can understand and grasp who God is. And God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are not three different gods. Some other religions have tried to look at Christianity and say, well, you're not being monotheistic. You're being polytheistic. You have many gods, but that's not the case. It is one God, but there are three in one. Very unique situation that's hard to understand. Actually, the word Trinity is not even in the Bible. The word Trinity is not there. Trinity is our man-made word to try to understand the three parts of God altogether. And when we look at God's revelation from the very beginning of time, God has revealed to man who he is. And in revealing himself to man, we, man has tried to understand who this divine being is. When God revealed his law to his people Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 and 5, it's, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love your Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and with all your strength. There is one God. He has been very particular to let us know that he is one. But yet the word for God in Hebrew at that time, Elohim, is actually a word that can be also plural. So it can be God and it can be God's. It can be one and both. And so God, even in his name, revealed himself with an S at the end of the word. 
in our sense of understanding it in English. In the very first chapter of Genesis, when God is creating Adam and Eve, he says, let us make man in our image. God wants to make man in our image. It's not on there. Some of the verses aren't on there. Um, and so God already is speaking in plural and saying, you know, so, so man is made in the image of God, who's plural, right here. When the prophet Isaiah was being called by God to go and preach to the people, um, God said, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Even in one word, God is, God is singular and in plural. Who will go for us? Um, and so it's very complicated in a way to understand the difference. A few months ago when we talked about the baptism of Jesus, the beautiful thing about the baptism wasn't just that Jesus was being baptized. It was the fact that here we had the Son of God who was being baptized. And you had the Father saying, this is my Son in whom I am pleased. And then you had the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove coming down and resting on Jesus. And so you had all three parts of the Trinity working in one spot. And the people that were witnesses of that got a very rare glimpse into the fact that God is more than one. He is three, but he's in one, and there's unity there. When Jesus gave his disciples the Great Commission, he said, Go into the world and preach the gospel and teach them and have them be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So these are... You know, we, we serve one God, we follow one God, even though there are three parts of it. One of the best parts of the Bible to, to read about the Trinity at work is Jesus himself taught about the Trinity. It's not just in like one little section that explains it, but in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, those three chapters. And I'll give you that homework assignment if you're looking for something to read in your Bible this week. Go to John 14, 15, and 16. It's written in your bulletin there in the, in the sermon notes. But Jesus spoke a lot to his disciples about the role of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. How they were united in what they, who they were and what they were about doing here. And we read some just awesome examples here. And we'll read these here on the screen. John 14, 9 to 10. Jesus said, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. We see this in a human level in the kids. You see reflections of the parents in the children, not only just physically, but the way they act and they talk. And the same thing here. Jesus is saying, if you want to know who the Father is, look at me. I'm a reflection of the Father. And not just a reflection, but, but he is in me and I am in him. We are together. Next one here, John 14, 24. He says, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. And the words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Jesus came, and when he spoke, it wasn't just him, Jesus, with these, these ideas. He was speaking what his Father wanted him to be able to speak to the people. Next passage here. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. An advocate is a person who will stand in and help you help you and be with you forever. And that's the spirit of truth. Jesus is warning them and saying, I'm going to go away here, but the Father is going to give you the spirit who is going to be with you and be that advocate that helps you along the way. And he tells us about that. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. So the Holy Spirit, who sent from the Father, reminds us of Jesus' words and his actions. And they work together to be able to help us to grow in our faith. Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You know, Jesus could have just stayed alive for thousands of years and done his work, but he was limited with a human body that would not allow him to be able to be in more places at once. But the Holy Spirit can be everywhere. And the Holy Spirit goes with his people and throughout the world convicting them of sin and helping them to be able to find the way to God. 
And so the Holy Spirit has a great job to do that Jesus himself realized he couldn't do just in and of himself. And then Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That's why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. It almost gets complicated here, but what, what Jesus is saying here is that the Holy Spirit is going to help us to glorify Jesus. It's a gift from God the Father to be able to understand who God is, to be right here dwelling among us. And if you read through chapters 14, 15, and 16, you'll get into more details about all this, but just what the connection is between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, how they are united in one, and it's some of the best teaching in the scripture that we have. You know, we have the Father, and the next three weeks we're going to break down. Next week we're going to talk about just the Father, which, which is on Father's Day, works out really good. Then we're going to talk about Jesus, the Son. And we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit after that. And I just really hope that you get in on this so that we can get a bigger picture of just who God is. As I'm preparing this, it's just, even though I kind of know God and everything, it's just sitting down and taking it in. It just, wow, it boosts my faith. Knowledge increases our faith, which helps us to change in our character, which allows us to go out and action and do what God wants us to do. And as we do those things, we grow in our knowledge of God, which increases our faith which helps us change in our character. We're transformed so that we can do what God wants us to do. And you've seen this little chart before. I'm just telling you right now that knowing God increases our faith. And we want to know God. We want to know the Father. We want to know the Son. We want to know the Holy Spirit. And we're going to work on those in the next few weeks to come. How to describe God in general, big capital G, God, um, it's hard to do it because on human terms, we don't always have the words to do so. Imagine if you're trying to describe Niagara Falls. Maybe you've been there, maybe you've seen pictures of it, and you've said, Niagara Falls is a bunch of water. It's a bunch of water. And you talk about the water. You're trying to use water to describe Niagara Falls. Now, there's so much more be behind the water that makes Niagara Falls so spectacular. You can't just describe it by talking about Niagara Falls as water, which it is. Niagara Falls is water. But there's so much more to that behind the scenes that makes Niagara Falls both beautiful and powerful. And you go down in that boat, if you've been there before, and you get down to the bottom of the falls, and even if it's a beautiful sunny day, all of a sudden it's dark. The water is pouring everywhere. You feel like you're in the middle of a thunderstorm. The power of it, the waves are rocking the boat. It's just amazing down in there, just the power behind it, just the beauty behind it. You know, millions of people a year, they go there, they get all the way there so they can stand and look at it, and there's nothing to do there but look at it, but it's wonderful to look at. And God is kind of like this in a way. Niagara Falls is spectacular, it's powerful, it's beautiful, and when you get down to it, you just look at it and go, wow, this is amazing, and that's the way God is. So we're going to try to describe God a little bit here. There's a bunch of verses I'm going to be reading here, but they're in your bulletin at the bottom. You can go back later and look them up. They won't be all on the screen uh, because I'm going to be going really fast through this. And it would just, you'd be so busy following the screens that you wouldn't be able to listen. So I didn't put all of them up there. But let's talk about some characteristics of God. One of the first things is that God is a spirit. Okay? God does not have a body. You can't touch God. You can't really see God. He's a spirit. The spirit is invisible. Um, we can't really say what God looks like. But the beautiful thing is, God, in the Son of God, took on a body like you and I have. And when we look at Jesus, God in a human body, it helps us to feel like we can connect to God a little bit better. Because God became like us and took on a form like us. And one of the beautiful plans of God is that he helps us get to know him by looking at the man Jesus. And when we teach the little kids in Sunday school about Jesus, it helps them get to know who God is. Because everything that Jesus did and said, as we read before, it comes from God. To get to know God the Father, we get to know Jesus. And we get to know the Spirit. We see it all together there. There are some 
verses in the Bible that talk about how people, when they've seen God in heaven on his throne, all they see is this dazzling light. And the, the descriptions that the writers try to use show that it's, it's something spectacular, but it's really hard to find the words to do it. They talk about rainbows and thunder and, and just diamonds and sparkling and glaring light. And, and whether God's throne looks exactly like that or if that's just the closest they could get to describe it, we won't know until we get there. Um, the Holy Spirit doesn't have a body because he's a spirit. He can be everywhere all at once. But the Holy Spirit said, I want to inhabit human bodies. I want to inhabit people who have trusted in Jesus and follow him. And so the beautiful thing is, is that God dwells in each and every one of us who have given our lives over to Jesus. And so even though God doesn't have a body, we see how God took a body in the form of Jesus. And we look around the room and we see how God has taken on the form of bodies of the people that we worship with every week. It's a beautiful thing that God has reached down to us and made his home here amongst us. So God is a spirit. God is also self-existent. He was never created. He never started. And I know my kids sometimes have said, when I think about that, it makes me so scared because it's a very complicated thing to think that God never began and he never is going to end. Eternity is something our minds can't grasp. But God was never created, and he's never going to end. He is self-existent. John 5, 26 says that, For as the Father has life in himself, he's granted the Son to have life in himself. They are, they are the, the source of life. God is the source of life. Without God, there is no life. And he always was. He always lived. God is omnipresent. If you don't know the prefix omni, omni means all. So all, present everywhere. So God is present everywhere. Uh, because he is spirit, he can be everywhere. He can be aware of everything going on at all times, everywhere. He fills all space and time. And he gives it purpose and value. In 2 Chronicles 16, 9, it says, The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And not that God has eyes, but that's our understanding that God sees everything that goes on. God is everywhere and he is present. God is unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. God doesn't change as he was he is and will be. He is unchanging. He is also omniscient. Here's that omni, um, science, knowing. He knows everything. That's what this word means. He's all-knowing. Um, the Bible tells us repeatedly, who can know the mind of the Lord? Who can understand him? Because his knowledge, his understanding is so much greater than anything that we have. His knowledge is perfect and complete. And the Bible tells us that he knows the name of every star, those billions of galaxies that have billions of stars in them. He knows the name of every one of those stars. I can hardly remember my own kids' names, three of them, okay? God knows the stars, all their names. He tells us that he knows the location and the situation of every bird flying around. And when one falls to the ground, he knows about it. He says that he knows how many hairs are on our head. So every day, as that number changes, he's totally aware of even the numbers of hairs on our head. He is so knowledgeable that we can't even grasp that. 1 John 3, 20 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. He sees everything. He knows everything. God is true. God cannot lie. Every word from his mouth is just bathed in truth. In Titus 1, 2, we're talking about the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. He's, if he makes a promise, he's going to keep it. He's not going to turn his back on it. And all of God's promises are true, and we can trust them because he is true. God is holy. Holy means set apart. It's like one of a kind. There's nothing like him. He's in a class by himself. Nobody can be compared to God or nothing can be compared to God. Isaiah 40, 25 says, to whom will you compare me or who is my equal, says the Holy One.
God is righteous. He can do no wrong. He can only do good, and he's the author of good. He set the standard of what good is. In Psalm 50, verse 6, it says, The heavens proclaim his righteousness, for he is a God of justice. Justice is a result of righteousness. When you're good, you know what is right. You know how to fairly discern, and he's able to do that. He is 100% just along with his righteousness. And he has the power as the judge, the righteous judge, to be able to decipher right from wrong, guilty from not guilty. He's the righteous judge, and we submit to his authority. 1 John 4, 8 tells us God is love. God is love. He's not just a loving God, but he is love. And any love that we experience here on earth is because it came from him. He's the source of love. Even people that don't know God, there's enough of his love that's put in the heart of man so that they can at least be capable of, of some sort of love. They may not know it comes from him, but it does. And he's the creator of love. He sustains us in his love. And when he mixes his love with holiness and righteousness, it becomes a thing called grace. God giving us things that we don't deserve, but he goes beyond and showers us with his grace and his love. God is omnipotent. Omni means all, potent means powerful. He's all powerful. Anything that he wants to do, he can do, he's able to do. He cannot create a rock that's too, too heavy for him to hold. Okay? He is able to do everything. And he does everything in the way that he wills it to be. His will stands. Ephesians 1.11 says, In him we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works everything in conformity to the purpose of his will. Everything happens according to his plans. He cannot act contrary to his nature, and he works within even the midst of all the evil and the frustrations of sin in this world. He works above and despite it. The last thing that I mentioned earlier, God is relational. I think this is one of the greatest things about God. As I said, within the Trinity, there's a relationship, and God wants a relationship with people that he created. It's a beautiful thing that God wanted a relationship so badly that even though man turned their back on God, that he sent his son into the world on Christmas Day to be born as a little baby, to grow just like we did, to be able to offer his life as a sacrifice for our sins. There is so much that we can say about God. These are just some of the big things that we can say about him. We, when we see this, we stand in awe of him. We go, wow, that's God. But we also humble ourselves before him. We just go, wow, I just can't believe it. And I see who God is. I see who I am. And it kind of shows us that we're not as strong as we always think we are. He shows us that we have, have our own weaknesses. And we have to rely on him. We do need him. Every hour we need him. And he's calling us to come home to him. And when we come to this table here, we come to this table today in awe. Wow. God invites us to come and be with him. But it's a very humbling thing as well. To be able to say, wow, God invited me to come here. Despite my sin, despite my weaknesses, despite the many times that I failed him, he wants me right here. And in humility, we come before him and accept his gift of grace that he gives us, even at the table today. I love this verse from Isaiah 57, verse 15. It says, this is what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. He says, I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. You know, to be contrite and lowly in spirit, those that are humble, those that they say, I know I'm not the center of the universe, but God is. And I humble myself before him. And God comes to those people that are humble before him and says, I want to dwell with you. And that's what he's done by Jesus coming to earth and also giving us the Holy Spirit who's with us today. We have a wonderful God.
Let's stand and sing a song that talks about God's amazing grace.